What's up guys, coming at you from Shenzhen, and today I'm going to talk about the global propaganda campaign we're all experiencing, uh, particularly against China. Put some of it into context and talk about a video, which was a debate from five years ago, which is actually really useful to understand what's going on. And that was a, let me pull it up here. What was that called? That was called China and the U.S. are long-term enemies. So you had two folks on one side arguing, no, they're not long-term enemies um, and or they shouldn't be. And arguing on that side was Robert Daly and Kevin Rudd. On the other side saying, yes, uh, China and America are long-term enemies was uh, Peter Brooks and John Mearsheimer. So very valuable debate, even though it was five years ago, to really get a good picture and understanding of what's going on today. But the other reason I wanted to talk about that video was because something Robert Daly said was cut a little bit too short. It was just so unfortunately cut into a small clip and it went viral on the Chinese internet. And they thought that what Robert Daly was talking about in that clip was his own ideas and how he thinks things should be done. When in fact it wasn't, he was talking about the absurdity of the idea that no matter what China does, even if there were no human rights abuse concerns, even if they adopted the American political system like America says they should, the China's rise is something that America should smash back down, even putting people back in poverty if they need to, to uh, retain global hegemony, to make sure that America is still and will only be, will ever be the only single global superpower. Um, so what I want to do is I want to play those clips for you in in a little bit of a longer format. They're still very short clips, but so that you can understand the full context. I know there's a lot of uh, people from China that also follow my YouTube channel. So you guys can take a look at it as well and understand that uh, Robert Daly wasn't the bad guy here. He was actually saying, this is ridiculous. But instead of starting with that clip first, I want to start with something he said earlier on where he asked the other side, he asked Mearsheimer a question saying, are you sure this is? these are the kinds of people we want to be? This doesn't sound right. This is immoral. He asked him a question directly if he would condone pushing China, Chinese people back into poverty to accomplish U.S. global interests. And he didn't want to answer it at first. Uh, he, he answered it with a question and then he went off on this rant. So what, I, what I'll do is I'll cut that, that garbage out in the middle and go back to when he's asked again, when the host says, hey, you still didn't answer the question. I want you to answer it. And he said, oh, what was the question again? <laughs> I, don't, I, really, I, I really think he didn't want to address it directly, but he did address it directly. And he basically said, yeah, they should push China back down. If they had an ability to do it, if he could do it, he would do it. Um, so let's start with that clip first and then we'll talk about it from there. I would like to ask then what, what the United States should do. I just met Professor Mearsheimer backstage, seemed like a very nice guy, but you have advocated that the United States, in defense of its interests and to protect its current status, actively seek to harm the economy of China, a place that has brought hundreds of millions of people out of absolute poverty. You advocate for dropping some of them back into poverty. This would hurt their medical system, their educational system. Is this what we want to do and be? Are these the sorts of methods that we, we have to use, that we are predetermined to use? Let me ask you a question. Wait, he just asked you a question. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> that's right. no, but all right, all right, all right. We're going to no, stop the, this the a second. We've and, about we're going to stop this a second. We've got World War III here. Uh, and John Mearsheimer, I still want to hear your answer to his question. Wh which is the question? You don't remember his question? <laughs> no. His question is, what would you do? And he says that you're talking about actually harming, harming the other side. If, no, if I was in a position to slow down Chinese economic growth, I would definitely do it. China is going to be a potential peer competitor, and we're going to have an intense security competition. And you go to countries like Japan, you go to countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, they see this one coming. And people there, if they could hit a switch that would slow down the Chinese economy, they'd do it as well. So there you go. I don't think it gets any more clear than that. And I think it, what he's saying is obviously U.S. foreign policy for anybody who really takes a close look um, underneath. You know, the, the, the U.S. will uh, go after even their allies if they kind of start out competing them in areas that um, are too important to the U.S., you know, this isn't about, I know they always talk about a rules-based, fair society, you know, equal competition. No, it doesn't matter. Um, once you are threatening um, an industry or global dominance in the case of, uh, of China, which I'll get into a little bit uh, later, then uh, you're done for. They're going to come after you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move into the actual clip that was cut and put on Chinese uh, social media, put on Douyin. 
with a slight extension on it so you can see that he's actually talking about the absurdity of the whole situation. He's not saying that this is what we should do. So let's listen to that now. The United States must make sure that we do not have a peer competitor for our security. Th think about what this means. This is a brutalist philosophy. The proposition is that even if China were to change in some of the ways that proponents of engagement have been said that we hope it changes, even if they just, as a thought experiment, adapted our constitution and our laws wholesale, we should still try to limit their growth merely because we shouldn't have a peer competitor. That is the proposition, regardless of beliefs, regardless of people striving for human flourishing along the lines that we have been prescribing to the world for decades, if they actually appear to be succeeding, regardless of their beliefs, we must stop them, even if it means pushing them back toward poverty. Robert, have I, I misunderstood I, Robert, the proposition? I don't, I, don't, I don't mean those questions cynically or <laughs> sarcastically, but what's wrong with that? <laughs> that question at the end, I don't mean it cynic, cynically or sarcastically. I mean... <laughs> That, that, is the, that is the train of thought for people who really, um, underneath it all, they just want to maintain global dominance. Um, this is what a lot of this narrative is driven by. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're an enemy or an ally. You know, America's going to get nasty with you if they have to, um, to, to control whatever it is they want to control or uh, maintain their position in this world. Uh, the current global order. Actually, what I'll probably do from here is I can share a clip with you. It's also from um, from Mearsheimer, where he was talking at a different event in Australia. And I think this goes to show uh, even more clearly what the U.S. is about when this is even how they talk to their allies. And this is, of course, you know, uh, Mearsheimer is going to be saying the quiet bits out loud here, but you can find plenty of evidence throughout history to say, well, that's actually true, even in the context of allies. So let's play that video now. Now, the question is, what does this all mean for Australia? Uh, you're in a quandary for sure. Everybody knows, everybody knows what the quandary is. Security-wise, you really want to go with us. It makes just a lot more sense, right? Uh, and you understand that security is more important than prosperity? Because if you don't survive, you're not going to prosper. Survival is of the utmost importance because you can't pursue any other goals if you don't survive. Right? So security has got to be number one. So you'll sacrifice prosperity for security. Right? That's what will happen. That's why you'll be with us. Now, some people say there's an alternative. You can go with China. Right? You have a choice here. You can go with China rather than the United States. There's two things I'll say about that. Number one, if you go with China, you want to understand you are our enemy. You are then deciding to become an enemy of the United States. Because we're, again, we're talking about an intense security competition. You're either with us or against us. And if you're trading extensively with China and you're friendly with China, you're undermining the United States in this security competition. You're feeding the beast from our perspective. And that is not going to make us happy. And when we are not happy, you do not want to underestimate how nasty we can be. Right. Just ask Fidel Castro. I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't get more clear than that. I mean, it, 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 the U.S. regime, no matter, it, you know, the, this, this superficial blur between, you know, Democrats and Republicans, it doesn't matter when it comes to foreign policy. Um, you know, this is the U.S. The U.S. is one of the biggest gangster organizations. They're one of the biggest funders and supporters of global terrorism. This is this is who they are. Um, and it's always um, to serve their own interests. Um, as I as I said, plenty of evidence of them going after allies as well in the history. So what do I got next? Um, all right. So let, let's jump back to that debate. Uh, because this is going to be really valuable to understand the propaganda storm that we're under right now against China. So at the end of uh, that debate, there was a question period. And, uh, well, I'll just let you hear the clip for, for yourself. Here, let's go. Uh, your question was whether we could get the American people exercised enough that they would be willing to fight in those specific situations. And I think that the United States is so good at threat inflation and fear mongering that we'd have no problems with that issue. Robert Daly. So good at fear mongering and threat inflation. Of course they are. We've seen it over and over again. It is remarkable what they can do. 
um, the level of um, kind of uh, psychological warfare uh, that they can deploy on its people is really remarkable. Um, how they do it is it, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated because you have um, USAGM, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, which focuses on psychological warfare overseas. But technically, the uh, U.S. government, they can't do psychological warfare on their own people. So they have workarounds. Like when they were um, when they were trying to discredit the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, they had their top kind of uh, uh, psychological warfare guys resign from the CIA and then join private companies to run the campaign against their own people to get them to think the right way. Um, so that'll happen in different ways, uh, influencing uh, media outlets, uh, things like this, feeding stories, feeding leaked documents uh, to these news agencies. Um, and uh, how about we just, you know what, I think maybe one of the best things we can do is let's just take a look at some of the recent headlines to get an idea of <laughs> how much fear mongering is going on. So first one here, China poses the biggest threat to the US, a new intelligence report says. A lot of this stuff will come from the intelligence community. And it'll be leaked over to journalists to say, hey, you wanna write a story on this. Um, China is the greatest threat to freedom, US intelligence chief. China is the greatest threat to democracy and freedom, US spy chief warns. China is national security threat number one. I mean, like this should be so obvious what's, uh, what's going on here. <laughs> like. I, I don't I don't understand like how people can't see through this when it's just overdone to a point where you're like, hold on a second. I think this seems a little bit um, too uniform, too uh, kind of manicured. Maybe there's a reason that that story that Daniel keeps talking about, about the, the, the camp survivor also from from China, who's on her third version of the story and who had her passport renewed while she was under arrest, was propped up by all these media outlets. And there's literally a campaign to get the BBC to answer why there wasn't any due diligence done in this story. And they're not responding to it. Like all of these red flags and all this stuff going on, you'd think people would start saying, you know what? I think I'm being fooled here. And <laughs> I got, I got to, I got to show you uh, where they took this, how far they took this. So let, let, let's take a look at this. So this is one article that says uh, the U S adds Chinese supercomputing companies to export blacklist. And then in the article, it says <laughs> in itself, it says, the U.S. Commerce Department has says the groups were involved in building supercomputers used by Chinese military actors and facilitating programs to develop weapons of mass destruction. You know what? Like some of us who are pushing back on this propaganda, we use the weapons of mass destruction story to talk about what's being manufactured in terms of the narrative about Xinjiang. And we sometimes use the Naria, uh, Naira testimony also, the Kuwaiti girl. And we're like, th use those examples to remind yourself how coordinated these propaganda campaigns are. I didn't think they were going to go out and actually use the words weapons of mass destruction. I thought they would be like, you know, we can't reuse this. We got we to gotta get a little bit more creative. But apparently, I think what's happened is they've looked at how easy this is. Like putting Tersenay's story out there and everybody's like, whoa, this is serious without looking at the holes. With all of this stuff going on, they're like, you know what, guys? Uh, this is what I'm assuming. They're like, you know what, guys? This is too easy. Let's just pull out some of those old stories, weapons of mass destruction. Let's just recycle them. These people are just falling for it, hook, line, and sinker. We don't even need to try here. <laughs> so they're just they're just literally putting weapons of mass destruction stories out there. Um, I, I don't even I don't even know what to say to the people who can't see through this, see how coordinated it is. And uh, I can tell you. It's, it's only going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. Um, there is a, uh, let me pull the article up here. So there's a new um, article, some new details that are coming out saying, uh, it's talking about the details of sweeping efforts to counters, uh, counter, counter China's rise. And let's see what's inside that. So in this uh, proposal, they're looking for $300 million per year, every year from 2022 to 2026 to counter the Chinese influence. We'll get into a little bit more about what that means in a second. Um, perhaps uh, more important, which I'm going to get into a little bit more detail later on, is that they uh, authorized a uh, hundred million dollars for USAGM, U.S. Uh, global Media, U U.S. Uh, Agency for Global Media. That is basically the propaganda arm for the CIA. They run Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, um, these kinds of outlets to influence other people. And um, this is a really interesting one. So let me get back to this in a second. But continuing on. They also include uh, a note in there that they, they want to raise awareness and increase transparency regarding the negative impacts and activities used uh, related to the Belt and Road Initiative. 
you know, th this is really disappointing for me because, you know, with China going around the world and giving these resource rich countries a new option, a new partner to deal with other than the West with what Noam Chomsky uh, called uh, IMF fundamentalism, these crippling requirements on these countries, uh, both politically, not being able to put uh, subsidies on their agriculture, um, putting them in a situation where their local businessmen, their smaller businessmen aren't going to be able to c compete with the uh, Western multinationals. Um, overthrowing governments if they don't play ball exactly as needed. I mean, all this stuff, we're not seeing China doing that yet. Um, in fact, we're even seeing, um, there was a, an African lady talking about how in their markets in her particular country, I, I don't have the exact country um, uh, here. I didn't pull that, that video up here. I didn't prepare that video. But she was talking about how in the markets, the local government wanted to restrict the Chinese merchants coming from these big companies from entering during certain hours so that they could give a little bit of additional favor to the local uh, farmers who wouldn't be able to compete with the level of resources that these incoming companies would have. And then when they do enter the markets, they have to sell something different from the locals. This pushed the uh, Chinese merchants to diversify and start growing mushrooms or different things uh, locally. And it brought a great interesting diversity to the marketplace and still gave locals a chance to compete. Um, I, you're hearing lots of stories like this. I, I don't think it's perfect. I think you can probably find some issues with what they're doing. The overall goal is, of course, uh, to have some personal gain with these uh, relationships as well. But it just seems to be a little bit more win-win than the options before. And you can just assume that on your own by asking the question, if China's options are so brutal and so you know terrible for these countries, why are they choosing China over your options? How much worse must your options be that they're still choosing China. I mean, this is a logical question that you've got to ask yourself. So I was hoping that this would be a catalyst for the U.S. to offer even better options, saying, wow, you know what? All these countries that used to be uh, working together with us, um, sometimes involuntarily, uh, are now going somewhere else. we got to come up with something better. Let's compete with the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's, let's try to offer something better. How about instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars to pull the carpet out underneath China so that we can remain the most the, the single global superpower the exploitative superpower that we've always been how about we just say all right you know what this shows up we had we had a good ride um now let's just compete on fair terms now these hundreds of millions of dollars are being put into undermine what China is doing and that includes uh putting out an incredible amount of propaganda so you can expect a lot more of that to come now going back to the USAGM so USAGM is really interesting USAGM is like i said the propaganda outlet for 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 the US government and um i listened to a panel uh it was it was like uh, i can't remember exactly when last year but the USAGM was complaining that they were Trump was cutting their funding. They were kind of falling apart, you know. And they're trying to explain this is really important. We need to, we you need, you know, this needs to be a priority. And now, uh, obviously, as you can see, uh, according to those uh, documents that I shared with you, uh, they're back. They're going to get lots of funding and lots of infusing to counter the China threat with anti-China propaganda. And so, I want to take a few clips from that old hearing. It was a really long hearing. I watched the, I watched the whole thing uh, last year. Um, so you can get a feel for what um, what these guys are about. So let me play the first clip about one of these guys explaining what it is they do. Our networks include the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, the Office of Cuba Broadcasting, and our newest grantee, the Open Technology Fund. They're truly a gift from the American people to the world. As one of my colleagues on this hearing today, Amanda Bennett, is fond of saying, our organization exports the First Amendment. It's part of the foundation of our nation's success. They're gifting their laws, their way of life, uh, their systems to the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, what's going to be interesting from here is for you to listen that this gift, this beautiful gift, is something they don't even want to push on their own people because they understand it's psychological warfare. What I'm going to play for you now is another clip from the same panel where somebody else is saying that they don't want, they don't, the reason they don't use US AGM outlets in the US, they don't try to push their content in the US, is because they're afraid it will, <laughs> it will influence their elections. It will, you know, because they know this is psychological warfare. This is dangerous stuff. And he even goes as far as saying later on that it is a Cold War tool which is cheaper than using the military. So make no mistake, this is. Um, this is warfare. 
Um, it's psychological warfare, which is an incredibly important component to warfare these days. Um, and they want to be careful not to use it at home um, because it may do the same thing that they're always afraid that they accuse other people of doing as well. You know, Russia's interfering with our elections. Iran is, in, you know, meddling in our elections or, you know, running propaganda campaigns. So is China. When literally they have an entire department funded with hundreds of millions of dollars doing the exact same thing overseas. Um, there's actual evidence of that, <laughs> unlike their claims. But anyways, let me, let me play that clip for you to really understand what I'm talking about here. The soft power of the United States costs almost nothing compared to our military forces and doesn't endanger our servicemen and women. That's why we prohibit these organizations from communicating with the American people, because there could be some effect on our elections. So there you go. I mean, that's in pretty clear terms. Uh, you know, a lot of the times they try to dance around what they actually do uh, by softening the language, you know, um, exporting our, uh, you know, uh, this is our gift to the world and all this kind of fluff. But that, that's pretty, that's as clear cut as they got throughout the entire thing. And I think it's clear enough. So um, what we can expect now is definitely with this new infusion, uh, a massive spike in anti-China propaganda. I, I think probably... Um, you know, you, you, you're probably thinking, how could it be, how could it get even worse? Uh, but prepare for it; it's going to get worse. What's interesting is in the same report they spoke about anti-Asian uh, hate crimes in the U.S. In the same report, uh, with the recommendations to give all this money uh, to these agencies to run these anti-China uh, propaganda campaigns. Um, so I think they understand the link, um, the obvious link between anti-China propaganda, yellow peril 2.0, and the attacks on Asian Americans at home. But this bill offers no money or funding whatsoever. Uh, to help prevent uh, Asian hate crimes in the U.S., um, even, though, even though they know that what they're doing here is going to uh, create an even bigger spike. They have some other programs elsewhere uh, that where they are trying to address this, but not in this bill. They just go as far as seeming like they understand the connection. Now, um, one thing that also was made clear in the article that's talking about this proposal is that the uh, well i'll just read it for you directly leaders of the u.s senate foreign relations committee introduced legislation on thursday to boost the country's ability to push back against china's expanding global influence by promoting human rights providing security aid and investing to combat disinformation well it's actually to put out misinformation but anyways the most important point here that i highlighted under red is that make no mistake the reason the u.s is interested in human rights issues in china is not because they're really interested in human rights issues in China. They're only bringing it up because it's a way to push back against China's expanding global influence, which is encroaching on American uh, dominance over the world. Uh, make no mistake about that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, because America only does things uh, in interest of itself for, you know, to accomplish some sort of a geopolitical goal, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't overlap with real human rights issues. It, it sometimes does. Uh, the problem and the risk is that the interest in that group that they're pretending to care about will very sharply drop off as soon as they've accomplished whatever geopolitical uh, goals that they set out uh, to accomplish or once they reach a compromise that they're happy with. It will completely drop off. The people that you were talking about all the time, suddenly you'll, you, you won't even know. You won't even realize. You're like, shoot, weren't we like, weren't we two years talking about the Uyghurs? Like, well, whatever happened to that? Um, I'll illustrate that with Libya. The number one thing that the American government wanted to do was get Gaddafi out. This guy who was potentially going to make a, a, a gold-backed African uh, currency, who was nationalizing his resources, who, you know, I, he, this guy, this guy, of course, was not a saint, but during his time there, you know, they had free health care, free education. They had an amazing land reclamation project, you know, uh, uh, taking the desert, turning it into farmlands and giving this land to Africans uh, to farm on. Um, and now what you have is you have Africans being traded in open slave markets for $400 a head. Um, you have mass terrorism. You have all the stuff that Gaddafi said would happen without a kind of a strict, strong leader above. Um, again, I'm not going to excuse anything that Gaddafi did, you know, but I'm going to say that you can't look at this in a black and white kind of a, 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 a concept. Uh, things are a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but anyways, uh, on to my main point. Take a look at this chart. 
This is from Alan, and he says, interest in Libyan human rights spikes massively 10 years ago, then falls to almost nothing after March 19th, 2011, the day of the U.S. NATO, the day the U.S. NATO began its, its intervention. What a fascinating coincidence. You know, it reminds me of a quote. I, I can't remember if it was uh, Noam Chomsky uh, who said it, but someone said that the news doesn't tell you necessarily how to think. It tells you what to think about. Nobody's nobody's talking about the slaves being traded in the open, you know, markets in in Libya. No, no, nobody's talking about the real issues of the world. They're 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 being told that this is what you guys need to focus on now. You know, you would think that if if the U.S. was really interested in human rights, why don't they send some U.S. troops in to clear the landmines and unexploded ordinances in Laos that's still blowing off the legs of children? Not, but not only do they not do that, there were some British NGOs that went in to clear them. And for the longest time, they refused to release the, the schematics, which would show them how to disable these uh, mines without having them blow up in their face. They refused to release that to them because it was classified information. <laughs> like, if you really cared about human rights, why don't you go there and clean up the mines that you left behind? What's the, what, there's, no, there's no geopolitical interest there. There's no benefit. Right now... What you're seeing go on all around us is a completely manufactured campaign. It does Again, it doesn't mean there aren't issues that need to be fixed. But be aware of what's going on. You know, I would have thought as soon as that weapons of mass destruction story came out, there'd be more alarm bells going. But it just seems like this is going to continually decline and nobody's going to be any wiser. Despite, despite all of the past lessons we had a chance to learn from. Despite how ridiculously coordinated and dishonest the current narrative is. And it's going to get worse. So you guys do what you want with that information. But I wanted to put that out there to prepare you. There's more coming. Um, and then obviously this video, I wanted to, to, to uh, clarify Robert Daly's uh, position as well. But um, that's all I had to say in this video. I'm probably going to be doing a News on China episode soon. Um, and so look out for that. Until next time, guys. Peace.